All right, hey everyone, welcome back to Prep for Impact, Groom Beret Foundation podcast. I'm your host, Matt Parrish, and today we had a really awesome opportunity to talk to retired three-star Lieutenant General Ken Tovo. Some of you guys know the name. He was a former USASOC commander, the Army Special Operations Commander. Uh, he's had a storied 35-year career across Special Forces and Special Operations Forces. Uh, he was a West Pointer. He was a 10th Grouper, SOC commander, USASOC commander, was in charge of one of the main, uh, you know, one of the main forces that it was in the invasion of Iraq in 10th Group. Really awesome, uh, extensive operational experience from the Gulf War, Sierra Leone, Bosnia, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, and now is the chairman of the board for the Green Beret Foundation. And uh, I really enjoyed this conversation to hear him talk about the pre, uh, pre-global war on terrorism days of special forces during the Cold War, all the way through the invasion of Iraq, ultimately to being a strategic general officer in charge of 50% of the Special Operations Command landscape uh, for the United States. Really awesome to hear all of his different views and perspectives for those different things. We also talk about what he's doing now with the Green Beret Foundation, which I think is an awesome part of the end of the episode. And I guarantee you, you all are gonna really enjoy this episode of Prep for Impact, a Green Beret Foundation podcast. All stations, all stations. Prep for impact. All right, hey everyone. Welcome back to Prep for Impact. As you heard in the intro, got an amazing guest for you today. Uh, retired Lieutenant General Ken Tovo. Sir, it's good to see you again. Thanks for coming in. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Thanks. Yeah, well, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunity for us to talk about a ton of different things. You had a storied career across, you know, decades and decades of service, culminating as the use of SOC, as the Army Special Operations Command commander. Uh, we actually shared a deployment uh, years and years and years ago when you well, were the 10th Group Commander. One? Yeah, In 2007 in Iraq, okay. there was one uh, company, I believe, of 1st Group attached to your 10th Group. Yep. And then underneath that was one ODA from 7th Group, uh, 782 out in Al-Kut, Al-Kut yep. working with, with the El Salvador. El Salvador yeah. yeah, so uh, we've always kind of had, uh, you know, I just actually was messaging with some of my guys today saying, hey, I'm going to go record with Ken Tovo, and he was a group commander for our... So, uh, so was that the rotation when uh, Captain Trujillo was yes, sir. the ODA commander? That's right. Yep, yeah. Kevin Trujillo, uh, one of the, you know, top two and probably not number two uh, officers I ever got a chance to work with. Just, yeah. just flipped out from 7th Group Command, but... Yep. The battalion commander in 10th group. Yes, so sir. We, you know, yeah. We brought him into the fold. That's right. He was the seventh group guy. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. I, I was lucky enough and blessed to have two combat rotations with Kevin. Uh, my first two and his first two, we got to group within, I think, about 30 days of each other. And uh, I got a chance to, he actually helped train me to go to Ranger School uh, before we went and uh, just phenomenal guy. I could spend the rest of the episode talking about him, so I won't. But, you know, one of the things that I'm most interested in, sir, when we talk to, anybody who served, right? Uh, a lot of times I like to just start from like, what called to you? Uh, I know you ended up in, in West Point and going through that, but as a young man, middle school, high school, all that, was it family service? What was that initial call? Yeah. You know, like many things, it's uh, it's never just one thing. Sure. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I grew up in the sixties and seventies. Yeah. Um, everybody I knew at least all the males I knew had served. Uh, both of my grandfathers served in World War I, yeah. one in the US Army and one in the Italian Army, and they were on our side of that war. Um, uh, all my uncles were World War II vets. Uh, my dad was a little younger. Uh, he joined at age 17 in like 1947, was in the Army of Occupation in Japan and the Army Air Corps and then, and then yeah. the Air Force. You know, he got, he got out of the, made the decision to get out of the Air Force and beat stop loss for the Korean War by like <laughs> five days. So, you know, life would have been, would, would have been different. Um, but just everybody you knew, I mean, you know, mm. whether it was the folks at church, you know, everybody had either served in World War I if they were the grandparents or, uh, or World War II and, and the post-war. Uh, of course, Vietnam War is going on at the time I'm growing up, uh, and then, you know, for whatever reason, I was a history buff. Mm. I, I, you know, I was that nerdy kid who read military history yeah. uh, from an early age, and so I, I never really wanted to do anything else other than the military. Uh, 
my real plan, of course, was I was going to be a fighter pilot and go to the Air Force Academy. Not in that order, of course. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, and, and then about seventh grade, when I realized that I didn't see as well as everybody else, my fighter pilot dream kind of fell apart. And, uh, and then towards the end, it was between West Point and, um, and Annapolis, mm. where I was thinking about being a Marine. And, you know, like all those things that influence you, literally it was a uh, uh, high school visit by one of the friends of, of, of my high school buddy, or by the brother of one of my high school buddies, who uh, said, hey, you know, he was, he was home from West Point on leave, and he yeah. said, ah, you don't want to be a Marine. We got these things called Army Rangers and Green Berets. They're much more special than Marines. You want to go to West Point. And so that, you know, I mean, literally, that's about when I made the decision <laughs> between West Point and, and, and Annapolis. The story of Spec Ops Tools began with one disabled veteran who couldn't get his needs met after his service had ended. His friend, a longtime tool professional and veteran himself, knew that America owed it to veterans to do more, but didn't know how. Thus, the idea for Spec Ops Tools was born. It would be a professional hand tool brand with an aim higher than just making tools or making money. It would make a difference in the lives of veterans. Check them out today at specopstools.com. Prep for Impact is proudly brought to you by the Green Beret Foundation. The Green Beret Foundation offers emergency, immediate, and ongoing support to all generations of U.S. Army Special Forces soldiers, their families, caregivers, and survivors. The foundation provides direct support and advocacy to over 3,000 families each year. The Green Beret Foundation is here to assist you whenever you need them. Learn more at GreenBeretFoundation.org. Yeah. No, it, it's uh, it's always funny. I like to ask that question a lot because you, you hear a lot of those same things. And it, to me, it's it's interesting to hear kind of the origin stories of service from different people, especially as we look at, uh, you know, continued recruitment and everything right. else. It's always interesting to kind of go back and like, OK, well, where did a Ken Tobo come from? Where right. did a, Well, so much know, of that's family yeah. influence. And even now, I mean, if you look yeah. at, at uh, I, you know, once again, whether the statistics, statistics are true or not, I mean, you know, I, yeah. I recently heard from a senior sergeant major that. It's something like 85% of today's recruits are in because they had a family member, mm -hmm. you know, an immediate family member who had served mom, dad, brother, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at that, you say, well, that's a, that's a tough model to sustain. Absolutely. Uh, as, and, as it's waning, that's yeah, a tough model. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, and particularly if you do anything that upsets the balance where mom and dad no longer recommend to their son or daughter this is a career path, then you've got a real problem in your recruiting base. And I think some of that's what we're seeing right now. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I'm curious, as you're going through West Point, you know, as you said, the Vietnam era sort of just before that and all, uh, you know, had you heard of the Green Berets during Vietnam? Was that, did that start early or was that after you had yeah, commissioned no, and joined? No, yeah. it was uh it was already on my radar. I think I read yeah. Robin Moore's book, The Green yeah. Berets, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> probably a half a dozen times before I went to West Point. Yeah. I'd seen the movie a couple of times, but I was a reader more than a watcher, so yeah. I, I had read the book. Um, and, and, and of course, it's on TV, so you know I'm kind of by osmosis getting some of that when, uh, when mm -hmm. the war was still going on. But I want to say the, the first real Green Beret I met was uh, uh, a guy named Master Sergeant Roy Benavides, a absolute legend, if not the number one legend in the community. Who, yeah. who had just recently <laughs> won the Medal of Honor. He was one of those, you know, yeah. kind of well after the fact. Yeah. And uh, he, he did a tour through West Point wow. and did some motivational speaking. And of course, you know, before he gets up there and, and they read the citation and you're like, wow. Yeah. And then and then it was really motivational. It, it didn't he did a, a talk right before one of our football games. It did not change the outcome, but he tried <laughs> damn hard. Yeah, it wasn't on him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean absolutely not enough motivation you know, could overcome some of the teams who were playing so. yeah if there's a mount rushmore of the special forces regiment yeah he's roy's there. on there for sure uh 100 percent. you know as you as you started considering you know i well i will say i'll back up a little bit you mentioned books being formative and it's it's something that i've always uh kind of laughed about a little bit because we as green berets a lot of times we wear the quiet professional thing very, very heavy. We make jokes yeah. about some of the other, uh, you know, soft tribes that maybe were a we little bit more verbose about yeah. some of those things, yeah. right? Uh, but almost all of us, I was the exact same way. When I started to join, I was grabbing every Green Beret book I could possibly find, Vietnam, Mac V. Sog. You know, at that point, a lot of the 
global war on terrorism stuff hadn't happened yet because right. it was 2002, 2003 when I was- You're a bit you know, younger than I am. Yes, as Tad, sir. Yeah, that's why you were a group commander and I was a little E6 running <laughs> around with a beard trying to stay off your radar uh, <laughs> during the 07 deployment, right? But it's it's interesting, you know, we we sort of isolate out and say, we're not gonna, we're not gonna talk about anything, but one of the biggest impacts to a young man or woman who's thinking about joining our ranks are the stories because uh, we don't all get a chance to meet Roy right. Benavidez, right? And so it's it's amazing, you know, uh, the impact that somebody being willing to sit down and talk about the, you know, what happened to them during their service and how it impact, impacted them and all that. I mean, it it creates ripples, right? Well, uh, we've, for a long you know, time. We've had, you know? this, we had this conversation actually during the war uh, yeah. a couple times of, you know, you know, my view at one point, you know, that I expect express higher when I was a group commander was hey, we will never have a better opportunity than what we're doing in Iraq and Afghanistan and the Philippines and everywhere mm -hmm. else that yeah. we were, despite yeah. the, you know, the commitment sure. to Iraq and Afghanistan to tell the Green Beret story. Um, yeah. you know, so we've, we've always been kind of challenged by, you know, where's the line between quiet professionals yeah. and silent professionals? And 100%. we tend to be the silent professionals. And, and so when you do that, though, you let other people write history. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I look at, uh, at, at some of the things that have come out of Iraq and you know you wouldn't know that your efforts on the ground in Al Kut or the yeah. other fifty some odd teams that we had in the siege of Soda were even there, based yeah. on some of these history books you read, because there's no mention of it. There's mention of other other folks doing things, um, yeah. but you know so, somebody's got to tell those stories. And of course, I haven't said that. I haven't written a book either. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, but I, I have encouraged it, others to write the book. To me, it's part of uh, like motivation. Uh, for like this podcast, right? Yeah, like the, yeah. the ability to be able to capture stories yep. from people and them not feel like, oh, well, I've got to go write this big book or whatever else. It's like, hey, let's let's talk about service. Let's talk about yeah. uh, some of those things because uh, there are, I, uh, it's amazing the amount of just incredible people that have done incredible things that a lot of times you, you know them for a long time and you never even hear some of those stories because you work with them later on in their career or whatever else and you're never walk up and like hey tell me a war story about whatever and then all of a sudden you find out you know you've known the guy for five years and you're like bro you got a silver star from you right. know saving somebody's life like well and, and it's interesting and it's really two things it's got to be the you know the individual stories matter yeah um, sure but but it's also the story of of what the force accomplished and um you know once again, I mean, as you said, yeah. we all grew up. You know, when you when you made the commitment to to join and yeah. go through the course, most of us started buying books and and tried to understand the legacy of what we were were joining. And you know, for me, it was and I've still got them on my yeah. shelf. You know, it's a it's all the different uh, Green Berets at War and, and and all the other books on on what the the regiment did in Vietnam. So you understood yeah. the legacy that you were inheriting, and and uh, we need we need to do that same thing for for these most recent conflicts. And a lot of this comes after the fact, even sure. if you look at yeah, some yeah. of those books that, that we grew up reading, guys wrote those decades post later. Post-service. Post-service. Yeah, 100%. Some, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. when they finally had time to slow yeah, down nobody's nobody's advocating, I don't think, uh, like coming home and immediately writing the after action review into a book, but it yeah. is nice to be able to go back and, you know, even for the wars that we participated in, to go back and find out about some of the actions of some of the other uh, yeah, you know, just, teams that you were on a different rotation, they might've been an hour away. It's you know? funny, I've, I've had this conversation <laughs> recently with a, a fellow Green Beret when we were talking about uh, the invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. You know what the tenth group portion of that yeah. story, and they're like, "Really? I never knew any of that stuff happened." Yeah, yeah, actually, it was a pretty big deal. You know? <laughs> two two thirds of the Iraqi army was up in the north. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you know we kind of kept them there, you know, by leveraging fifty thousand Kurds and all these other things yeah. that happened. And, and it's like, wow, never never heard any of that. Tenth group was there. I didn't. Tenth, yeah. <laughs> tenth group was even in Iraq. I thought it was all about fifth group, right? Absolutely. And of course, it's the same thing. I mean, I couldn't tell yeah. you right now, if you put me, me yeah. in front of a map and said, hey, outline what fifth group did in the invasion of yeah. Iraq, I'd like, I got a general idea. I was kind of busy. Yeah. Came from over here. <laughs> you know, I know there's some SEAL stuff going on yeah. here in the South. You know, I got a general idea, but yeah. you know, nothing to the level that, yeah. you know. It's one of those things. It, it's amazing to be able to just realize the, the depth of impact of some of the different uh, teams that, you know, you just yeah. never get a chance. You're, you're on a different rotation. You're doing whatever else. So. Right. You know, as we talk about your service and you look back, right, as you as you go through the qualification course and, you know, it's a very formative 
uh, process to not just get qualified and, and become a Green Beret, but then to actually join a team to get there. As an officer, you get to come in and now you are in charge of one of these 12 person teams that you've worked a year and a half to, right. to be a part of. Uh, you know, talk to me about that process for you coming in. How was your first team? Yeah. What do you remember about that experience? Yeah. Well, so first of all, um, I went through the old model. Yeah. Right. There was the, no, the 75 different models. There that we was, had, yeah. uh, <laughs> what, what year are we in right. SF history? That's how many models yeah. we've had, um, which is kind of, you know, running joke of, well, that's changing the standards in the yeah. Q course. So yeah, that's SOP. We do it like yeah. every year, it seems we change yeah. the model. So when I came through, um, there was no selection and assessment. Yeah. Um, it actually started soon after I finished in, uh, in, I guess I started in 87, finished 88. Yeah. Um, but, you know, phase one was essentially assessment and selection. Yeah, it was weed where, out. That's where yeah. you weed it out. And then, you know, if you failed out, then you were there on Fort Bragg for reassignment. But, uh, um, and, but it was a six month course. Yeah. It wasn't a year and a half yeah, process. Yeah, yeah. It was a six month course. And then all the officers at that point, and some of the NCOs did SEER, some folks mm -hmm. then went off to a specialty school. I got a year of language. So, you know, it ended up being a year and a yeah, half process yeah. for me. But for a lot of guys, it was a six month process. And then they went off to a group. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I did the course, did SEER, went off to uh, DLI and learned Polish, and yeah. then showed up in Bad Tulsa with, uh, with my wife and, you know, two month old baby, yeah. and uh, was met was met at the Munich airport by my team sergeant, and I want to say the two eighteen Bravos and maybe the eighteen F in a little van, and they, you know, rounded us up and brought us home, yeah. and and on the forty five minute drive to uh, Bad Tulsa from Munich airport, you know. They're laying out the next year's training calendar for me <laughs> to include like, yeah, and we're leaving for Fort Bragg like in three days for certification at Fort Bragg. And, and of course, my wife's like, holy shit, what have I gotten into? Here I am in a foreign country with a two-month-old baby, and he's going to dump me in temp housing. And as it turned out, my... Uh, my company commander was like, you're not going back to Fort Bragg in three days. He's yeah. like, I, I, I just came from there. I, yeah, I, I could no, just no, stay. Yeah. They're, they're going to, you know, they're going to go through without you and they'll, it'll all be okay. And, yeah. um, but it was, you know, e even then in quote, peacetime mm -hmm. group, uh, it was, uh, you know, right into the shotgun breach. There's, uh, yeah. you know, one thing after another. Of course, you know, I joined a, I joined 110 when the Cold War was, you know, still going on, yeah. and although there wasn't much run room left in it, none of us knew that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we had Cold War missions. You know, the, almost the first thing I did was, you know, go to the, go to the skiff and and look at the war plan, mm -hmm. and uh, and that drove what we trained on. It drove what we trained on even after the Berlin Wall wall went down because the Soviet Union hadn't gone away. So, um, I mean, it was, I won't say it was a, a true peacetime environment. Um, you know. Everybody believed that at any, sure. at any given yeah. day we'd we'd be parachuting into Poland to execute our yeah. our wartime mission. So uh, yeah, hundred you know, percent. What, what do you remember most about that time? You mentioned the wall coming down and like being there as one of the you know maybe not frontline troops if they came through, but obviously we we're going to be very involved in that plan. We were going to be <laughs> the, you know we're going to be behind the lines, right? right. It was we yeah. were you know at that time Tenth Group was executing very much a traditional approach to. Yeah. Uh, you know, as the SF mission, right? I mean, we, we all had something that we were supposed to do first. Some teams had an SR mission, strategic mm -hmm. reconnaissance. Uh, some teams had some kind of a direct action. We were a direct yeah. action team. We were going to uh, laze for F-111s yeah. to, uh, to put a bomb on a, a command and control bunker. And then we were supposed to raise the guerrilla army mm -hmm. in the rear of the, uh, you know, the Soviet lines. So yeah. it was, uh, the, the focus over there was very much unconventional warfare working behind the lines, raising partisans. Yeah. What do you remember? Uh, how was how was the kind of mood around group as the wall fell, right? Everybody is completely keyed up to like, hey, we're going to do this. And things start changing on a macro level. I'm just curious, like in the team room. It was shock, really. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, the uh, it, you know, we, we think we're in tune with the operational environment that we <laughs> kind of pride ourselves on that. Sure. Um, but literally, I mean, you know, you know, people are watching news. A lot of the guys speak German, uh, they've got German wives and they're watching the news, but it seemed to unravel it. It was really almost unbelievable that what seemed like a solid adversary, 
you know, the Eastern Bloc that mm-hmm. all of a sudden just unraveled in a course of a couple of days. You know, all of a sudden there's some people in the streets mm. and, and then all of a sudden they're tearing the wall apart. And it's like, never would have believed that was, you know, even five years down the mm. road when it, when it finally happened. It was just unbelievable. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. And, but then it took some time to, to try and figure out, so what does this really mean? I was going to say, right? it's not so like it went down it and it's like, yeah. all right, hey, pack it up, guys, we're good. Well, I mean, to kind of yeah. give you an idea how, of how quickly we sometimes adjust in our processes. Um, so that's 89. Soviet Union goes away, essentially, within the mm-hmm. next couple of years. Uh, I went to Fort Leavenworth as a major in 90. Four through ninety six. When I got to CGSC, you know the major yeah. staff course in ninety four, we were still fighting Krasnovians. Oh yeah, AKA sure. Yeah. Soviets, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, the army still yeah. hadn't changed the adjust. Had, and and for yeah. all I know, we're still fighting Krasnovians at Fort right. Leavenworth. But yeah. I mean, you know, from a yeah. educational perspective, it's probably desert the adversary had departed, <laughs> but it hadn't left the curriculum. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we obviously see that, you know. Across, uh, you know, even when I was uh, going through the Q course at the beginning of GWAT, it was still like, um, we've done some jungle stuff recently, and uh, what's, uh, yeah, let's just do, uh, you know, uh, hey, we got woods, let's do, uh, let's do a lot of woods SUT, yeah. and like you'll figure out the the desert SOPs once you get when to you a team. Get there, like, yeah. got it, got it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm curious when you think back. Although, if you make it, if you, if you want to really feel yeah. badly, I mean, I remember going to a range in. Uh, in 110 in mm-hmm. you know, 1989 90 mm-hmm. and watching another team at uh, one of the training areas and and they were working on break contact drills that was from vietnam Aust- yeah. that was the australian peel from vietnam yeah. why because their team sergeant had been a vietnam vet and that's what he knew yeah and so um once again we we pride ourselves on kind of understanding the operational environment but when it actually gets down to nitty-gritty sometimes sometimes we all fall back on what we know yeah you mentioned uh you know the invasion of iraq in 10th group at the time, as you mentioned, there's a ton of involvement there. Talk me through, um, you know, at this point you've risen in rank yep. and now you are in command of some of these forces and now there's the road to war. Obviously 9-11 happens, yep. Afghanistan, but then talk of the invasion to yeah. Iraq happens. Talk to me about that sort of process yeah. for you, where sure. you were. Yeah, actually, um, you know, I've told this story once or twice, as you might imagine, <laughs> but um, I I'd always tell folks that our planning for the Iraq invasion started on the afternoon of 11 September 2001. Mm-hmm. Literally, uh, you know, we were in a battalion exercise, guys up in uh, Montana, Wyoming. We were doing the headquarters out of the, the group ISAFAC, Derek Carson, and, uh, you know, that morning, one of my guys runs in and says, you know, hey, holy shit, sir, you got to come see this. Mm-hmm a plane just hit the towers. And so, you know, we did what everybody else in America and probably the world did. We went and watched the TV for the rest of the morning um, in disbelief. And then that afternoon, we turned the TV off and and started planning. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we kind of came to the conclusion that, hey, this is either, it's either going to be Iraq or Afghanistan. It came from one of those two places. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if it's Afghanistan, it's probably going to be fifth group. Although we hoped that the high altitude desert or a mountain terrain might might get us a a niche in there. But, uh, um, but if it was Iraq, we figured it would involve us. We had a history in Iraq from the Gulf War, uh, the post Gulf War stuff with, uh, with, you know, Kurdish refugees and provide comfort yeah. and provide comfort too with CSARS. So we, we felt like if it was Iraq, we had a piece. And so we literally started planning, um, you know, just trying to, as I call it, frame the operational environment, you know, understand ourselves, uh, you know, who, who in the battalion now participated in those operations a decade before what do we have in the files what do we have in aars all those things what did you personally you know you had experience in the gulf war what was your uh personal experience to be able to bring in then as a commander like did did you have yeah kind of eyes on things that you you wanted to bring to the fight yeah so my experience in the in the gulf war was uh i was um detailed to another governmental organization fair enough um to, to do unnamed activities uh, that largely did not pan out based on how long it took the process, the bureaucratic process yeah. take place. Uh, and that was a very different timeline, def- uh, Gulf War wise, than yeah. it was obviously later, which right. we didn't know in the invasion of Iraq, yeah. we didn't know it was gonna last you yeah. know, forever, but yeah. But but I had also, after after that experience, uh, had gone rejoined 110, mm-hmm. and then uh, you know we deployed soon after to, to northern, northern uh, Iraq, southern Turkey, mm-hmm. and spent a couple months there, you know, 
with Kurdish refugees. So yeah. we had gotten into northern Iraq. We had seen some of the terrain. We had met the people. We had developed relationships with the Kurds. And then I, I ended up leaving the group. And then, um, but some of the folks in, a, in the unit had done subsequent rotations, provide mm. comfort. You know, one of the company commanders had, was actually the last team leader in the Zaku house before it was closed in 1996, Pat Roberson, mm -hmm. currently the deputy commander yeah, yeah, yeah. at uh, Yusasak. So, you know, he, <laughs> and, and to show you how small our world is, uh, Captain Roberson at that time was working with either Lieutenant or Captain Foddle, who was the head of the security, the Kurdish security detachment. And of course, Fadl later becomes the guy that we help mm -hmm. build ice off major general Fadl by the time it's all over. So, you know, it all, yeah. all these, I that's use, the green beret. I that's mean, that the, is, and that's, a that's green, the secret that's, sauce, right? That's the secret yeah. sauce, right? Yeah. So relationships from 91 pay off for us in, in 2003 and on through. The year, so. Hey everyone, if you're enjoying Prep for Impact, please consider supporting us through joining the 1952 Society from the Green Beret Foundation. With your ongoing monthly recurring donation, you can help the GBF support the ongoing and increasing needs of our Special Forces Regiment. To find out more and take the first step, visit greenberetfoundation.org society. Hey everyone, you know, as a Special Forces engineer, I know how important it is to have the best tools available all across the world. That's why I'm excited for Prep for Impact to be partnered with Spec Ops Tools. Not only do they make the best hand tools around, but they also support veteran service organizations like the Green Beret Foundation. So go check them out today at specopstools.com. Yeah, if you're listening and you're not, uh, you know, from the SF community or from, you know, familiar with the Green Beret mission, we, we say that's the secret sauce because, you know, that is why we are regionally aligned. That's why we learn language, learn culture. And that's why we stay in the same group, usually, especially as enlisted guys. But even as officers try to return to some of the same areas of responsibility, because it happened in my career, it's happened in every Green Beret's career. If they've been in one location or one part of the world long enough a guy that you taught to shoot a pistol when he was a lieutenant suddenly becomes the head of their CT force yep. eight years later when you're down there. And suddenly that that relationship trumps every bit of statecraft and everything else that, that yep. is happening in the country. You being able to walk up just be like, hey, what's up, man? And all of a sudden you're good, right? I've yep. told a bunch of stories on Softcast about that happening to me yeah. as well. Well, certainly. Yeah. And, and I, you know, in, in my career, that particularly as I rose yeah. up and kind of got purview of more and more of the enterprise, my classic example was was frankly Seventh Group. Yeah. Um, and if you look at Seventh Group, particularly Seventh Group's involvement in Colombia, mm -hmm. it's it's that in spades. It's you know the, yeah. the the group commanders now dealing with you know chiefs of the army who, when he was a lieutenant, were his or you know when he was a captain were the counterparts uh, yeah. you know. At, at the small unit level, and they've they've kind of, particularly because in a lot of these countries, the special operations forces tend to rise to the top of their correct their yeah. service leadership. Um, yeah, those relationships that we build early on, often in very peacetime environments, pay dividends down the road, which is something that sometimes um, folks don't really appreciate and understand. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to quantify that but it happens again and again and again. Like it's it's an ancillary benefit. It, it shouldn't be an ancillary benefit. It is a it's main the, benefit. Yeah, I look at it, it as a strategic investment. It's, it's, it, it is a strategic 100%. investment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, and you know, I can give you example after yeah. example, but we've all watched it play out yeah. in the Ukraine. You know, the, the a lot of the Ukrainian performance is a result of seven or eight years of investment of permanent presence from SOF, yep. from the California National Guard and from a bunch of other folks who were in working with the Ukrainians ever since the Russians invaded Crimea in 2014. Absolutely, yeah, there's Green Berets. Uh, as you said, there's other forces there, there as well, but there was sustained Green Beret presence there and those relationships, yeah. uh, you know, hugely beneficial. Um, you know, to take it back to that invasion in right. Iraq, right? Is that, at that point, as you guys start that, tr you, you start planning, you know, as you said, the afternoon of September 11th, uh, walk me through yeah. as it now suddenly becomes real, and it's like, hey, it is tenth group, and yeah. we're uh, we're going to get to do these yeah, things. So, yeah, so you know, I, I said we started on Sept on <laughs> September 11th. Uh, yeah. We actually ran that for uh, you know a little while until it became clear it was Afghanistan, not Iraq, mm -hmm. um, and put it to bed for a few months. But by about uh, late winter, spring of twenty or of uh, uh, two thousand two, yeah, 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 senior no, moment, that's right. Um, 
it was back on the table again yep. and uh and it looked imminent as we yeah. as we started planning but but literally you know as i re- as i recall and we joke about this but you know we got a mission from uh from the sock that basically said 10th group go north <laughs> and, and fair enough like, okay <laughs> roger that roger that you know <laughs> we, you know we can we can handle that and and uh literally we had a saturday morning session you know all the battalion commanders the threes the sergeant majors uh, you know, kind of the senior leadership of the group with uh, the group commander, Charlie Cleveland, and we kind of scoped out, okay, what are, what are we supposed to do? Yeah. And and out of that Saturday morning session, you know, I, I use it as an example of operational design, but it's, it's we really answered the question of what should be done. Mm. Hey, this is a complex environment. We scoped we as best we could at that point, and we, we learned more over the months to came, that came uh, after that. But it was, hey, that's where we figured out, hey, look, our, our main job up here is, Keep keep thirteen Iraqi divisions up north where they are, and not helping defend Baghdad from the southern invasion force. And uh, and so then from that point on, uh, you know, a lot of things were planned. Mm-hmm. Very few executed as planned. But the overall intent of why we were going never really changed. Uh, you know, we thought we were going to drive in from Turkey. Turks wouldn't let us in. We thought we'd fly over Turkey. Turks wouldn't fly, let us fly over. Uh, you know, in the event some of us got in early. Uh, but the bulk, you know, came came from Jordan of all places, right? We based in Constanta, Romania, which is as close as we could get, and uh, the bulk bulk of the force flew one night into uh, into Jordan, and the next night did the longest low level infiltration since World War II in uh, in the back of MC 130s, and and uh, those AFSOC pilots earned earned their flight pay. Uh, we almost lost an aircraft had. Uh, had one that was shot up so badly that it actually had to declare an in-flight emergency. And uh, and at that point, the Turks did let them land when faced mm. with the prospect of 60 or 70 Americans getting killed because they wouldn't allow their airspace to be used. Sure. Um, and uh, But that's how we essentially opened up the Northern Front, was forcing, forcing the Turks' hand by, by coming in from Jordan uh, at, at extremely high risk. Yeah, the uh, you, you highlight, you know, through that action, you highlight one of the other sort of special forces, special sauce things as well, which is hand us a a wickedly complex problem and we will plan and figure out what needs to be done, how it needs to be done. There are other forces that are more uh, breaking case of you already have the con op done and you just need somebody to go do it. And that is not prototypically the SF mission. More often than not, it's like, this is really like, can you please do something about this? And it's usually not well-defined. Right. It's, and, a, it's a complex yeah. environment. We haven't really scoped exactly what the cause and effect is, what the mm-hmm. problem really is. And, and you know, when you have that kind of environment, you throw green berets in the middle of it and they'll you know, first endeavor to understand. <laughs> and usually our understanding comes through the fact that we don't try and do it ourselves. Right, yeah. we create these partnerships. Who can we people, call right now? Of yeah. people who live in the environment, you know, yeah. the indigenous partner, whether it's paramilitary or military, or or, or just citizens who are going to help us uh, achieve effects, and and they have that tactical, granular, local context that 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 allows you to actually then operate mm-hmm. in a foreign environment with with some hope that that the outcomes you try and uh, achieve are are the right ones. Yeah. And some hope of getting there, as opposed to trying to impose an American solution on a problem when we don't really understand the problem. Mm. When you when you think back about that actual invasion, and then the subsequent months after that, what's what pops into your mind? Like, what's the most searing? Is it the is it the flight in? Is it uh, you know? Oh gosh, there was subsequent. So many yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we we ended up uh, soon after we we got the first guys in. We we launched a. Uh, 10,000 man attack against Ansar al-Islam over on the Iranian border because the Kurds we were working with, the PUK, were were un, unwilling and unable to disengage from what that what was an existential fight for them that had been going on for a couple of years with mm-hmm. this al-Qaeda-backed terrorist organization, Ansar al-Islam. Um, and so, you know, our analysis had led us to the fact that we're going to have to help them take care of this problem before they're going to reorient. So they will go help us. So they yeah. will come to the green line and help us with our problem, the Iraqi army. And all of that came out of this analysis and this study that we had done. And of course, we got some guys in early that kind of validated that and we had some some conversations. So, I mean, that 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 event was, uh, you know, 
a big event for us, big in my mind. But then, you know, all the whole green line fight, seizing Kirk Cook and, and, and all those things. I mean, it's just, there's, there's so many stories from it. It's funny. My, uh, my three, Mark Gertovich, uh, was, uh, had been a small group instructor at SWIC. Mm. And, and he, he had the UW manual, you know, back, back then we called it the mission training plan. If you remember those, yeah. the, the camouflage covered book with yeah. all the tasks that, that are encompassed in this mission set. And, and literally as we're, we're going through, uh, this experience, uh, he, he went in early with me as well. And, um, uh, you know, we'd, we'd do something and he'd go check, you know, <laughs> meet, meet with the, you know, the underground, you know, check, plan, plan the uprising and deny territory check, you know, and, and that and Q course scenarios. And he'd go through the whole thing yeah. of, you know, oh, that's just like we did in Q, you know, in Robin Sage, remember yeah. when this happens, this is that scenario. And literally we went through the whole thing at the, towards the end. I mean, we had, uh, you know, I think we were out of Kirkuk at this point. We're really getting ready to redeploy. But when, after we had taken out Ansar al Islam over in Halabja, we had left one team behind with a battalion of Pesh to uh, to kind of do kind of rear area security stuff, if you will, because a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of these uh, AI guys had gone over the border into Iran. Some of them were infiltrating back, so there's a lot of mop up going on. And uh, he comes up to me one day in the in the uh, in the talk and he says, "Hey, sir, you know, in the Q course, you know that one scenario we haven't done yet." And I'm like, "All right." I'm waiting for it, Mark. It's like, do you know when, when your indige executes the prisoner and you have to deal with that, that <laughs> consequence? Yeah. Yep. We've got that one now too. And sure enough, I mean, long story yeah. short, but you know, one of the, the Pesh Battalion commander recognized that the guys they had just c captured were the ones that had cut the head off his brother. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they're driving somewhere back to the battalion headquarters and, and he just, He's like, okay, I can't, I can't let this go. He just stopped the convoy, pulls them out, shoots them, throws them in the ditch. Yeah. And of course, we've got two young NCOs who do what they're supposed to do, which is, you know, what the hell are you doing? Uh, he explains why he did it, they, he, and they call up for instructions. Mm. And so, you know, we said, Roger, reported, you know, noted. Um, we sent it on up to CENTCOM, uh, and then I walked over and talked to my counterpart, Jalal Talibani, future president of Iraq, and said, hey, this can't stand, um, you know you need to do something about this. We don't, you know, th this yeah. is, we have to be on the right side. We yeah. gotta be on the right side of this yeah, stuff. Yeah. And so they, they arrested him they put him through a UCMJ process and, and he went off to, you know, Kurdish mm. prison. Um, and I, you know, I, I never checked when I went back on subsequent tours, if he was still in prison. Yeah. Um, I suspect it might not have lasted long, but, uh, you know, we, we did what we had to do as far as meeting our obligations and they, and they at least appeared to do what they needed to yeah, do. Yeah. It's, well. it's so tough. But, but, but we did check yeah. all of those Robin yeah, Sage scenarios. Well, it's funny you bring that up. And the entire mission yeah. training plan for unconventional warfare. It's funny you bring it up because when you're in the Q course, right, and you go through some of those things, you're like, all right, man. This, like, this it's not happen. just going to. This would never happen. It might happen, but it's not going to tick down like this. You know, you can get the Ed Brody big road to war and like yeah. all of these crazy scenarios. And it's like, all right, man, I get it. We get, you know, Robin Sage, everything else. But like, surely it's not. And then you have the opportunity to actually be like, oh, actually, all of these things are happening. You know, we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, we don't, we didn't know it was going to last anywhere nearly as long as it did. Right. And at the invasion, you know, it's funny <laughs> was you guys were doing all of that. I was actually in basic training at the time when the invasion started. And I remember at the time we were, we were livid that we were going to miss the You're war. Miss it. We were going to miss the war. Like we needed to get out of basic training. And then we all as 18 x-rays knew we were going to like another year and a half. Right. And we're like, oh, everything Afghanistan is going to be done. Iraq's going to be done. We're going to be completely like, we're going to be the dudes that are afterwards and everybody else has got their CIBs. And then not knowing obviously that it was going to be almost my entire 20 year career. It was still yeah. in, two, uh, yeah, in 2007. Crazy. Yeah. In 2007, I'm in, uh, in Iraq for yeah, one yeah. of the siege of soda rotations. And, and, um, you know, my son just graduated high school. Mm. He's getting ready to go off to West Point, older son. And yeah. uh, so I'm having a little phone call with him before he literally separates from mom and, and, and starts mm -hmm. this journey. And But up until then, he was like, I'm not going to go. I'm going to I'm gonna enlist. I don't want to miss the war. Yeah. And I'm like, this is 2007. I'm like, son, this war will be going on well after you graduate. Trust me, you will get your chance. Heck, your son may get his mm. chance that you don't have yet. Um, he, he ended up getting three Afghanistan tours. Yeah. So, you know, it's like. Well, you, you had a better view at that point as the, uh, as the group clear. commander, as he's just commander. By, by 2007, <laughs> it was pretty clear yeah. that it wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah. I, uh, you know, 
I, there's so much, I, you know, I want to do another yeah. hour, but I want to make sure that yeah, we, sure. you know, I want to touch on a couple of things, yeah. right? Yeah. I want to touch on as you now matriculate with all that experience and you become a GOFO, you mentioned a little bit earlier, become a general officer and you start seeing that widened out, uh, you know, kind of view of the other tribes and all those things. You're the Soxent commander. You get all these different opportunities. How did that change your view of special forces and their role of how, you know, how it's interoperable through a, through these uh, task forces. But also, what do you remember as far as leadership maturation as you now, like you said, you've got the keys to a much bigger yeah. battleship? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, that, that progression is one that um, can be uncomfortable for mm. some folks. Um, you know, I think it's uncomfortable for any of us to, sure. to go through change. But, um, you know, the natural inclination is to... to Focus on the things you know and the things you like. Go back down a, a, and, a rung or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, and and we all, you know, we all think we're master tacticians, right? We must be because we got promoted up beyond it. Um, but the reality is, uh, you know, when as you move up to those jobs, nobody's paying you to to be a tactician. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I remember at one point I got a, uh, I was a Soxent, you know, two star running the the, yeah. the theater and uh, from a soft perspective and. Um, you know, we were trying to get some folks back into Yemen. And, and literally we got a call from the NSC staff um, asking if the Yemenis would have a tank at the front gate of the air base that we were going to build it, then a Navy SEAL element doing this training program. And my answer back was, hell, I don't know. It's not my job, right? I, we got a Navy captain, 06, yeah. who's gonna be the senior guy in country. I mean, that's tactical force protection stuff. And oh, by the way, a tank's not going to do any good because there's like no fence around this airbase anyway. Like it's not like it's a single point of entry, but it's like it's not my job. Mm. My job is is broader than that. It's and and uh, you know, may will I at some point go down and visit and and you know, if I see something wrong, am I going to ask questions? Sure, I'm going to do those things. But, but if you're the last line of defense, but if I'm the, if, yeah. if I'm if I'm the first line of defense <laughs> yeah. on tactics and force protection, et cetera, you know, I'm well out of my lane. What am I not doing? And that's and that's the thing that as, as you move up, you, you got to remind yourself is, hey, if I'm if I'm doing somebody else's job below me, I'm probably not doing my own job. And, and you know, you're paid to, to kind of have that broader vision to kind of ensure that there really is a, some level of a strategy that we're actually trying to achieve effects um, because we've become masters at tactical effects. Mm. You know, we yeah. haven't won a war lately. Yeah. And part of that is a lack of a strategy. And so, uh, you know, that's that's senior leader job. Yeah, no, it's, it's that's it's, really well said, and it's applicable across uh, all kinds of different industries, business, and everything absolutely. else. I mean, I in my current role talk about sometimes like, hey, you understand that the people above you probably came from where you are, and it is much easier to go back down into that than it is to have the uh, maturity and understanding to say, hey, okay, it's not my job not anymore. Myself. I've got to be up here, and you know, we see it all the time with the, you know, quote unquote, micromanagement. And oftentimes that leader's not waking up that day and like, I'm going to micromanage someone. They just, it's so much easier to go back down mm -hmm. to what you knew prior right. and you have experience and, and you, you did can, it well. And, it, yeah. and, you, and as a leader, you can also create that mm. because all those leaders in between you and that tactical level, if you're asking nothing but tactical questions, they're going to be forced to start micromanaging those below them because yeah. they know that I got to answer the boss's question. I got to know always, if the tank asked, is there. And yeah. he always ask, he's always asking me stuff in the weeds on tactics. And so I got to be ready for that. And so it, it's yeah. this kind of cascading effect of, you know, somebody has got to say, stop the madness, trust people to do what their job is. I mean, you're going to, you're going to have enough sense. You can do, you're going to take back briefs. You're going to listen to it and you're going to hopefully provide some level of experience, you know, the, the, the value of your experience. But, but in the end you got to let, you got to let uh, every kind of do their role and fill their responsibility. No, well said. I, one of the things that I saw the most in my, you know, in my career was the over reliance on full motion video and soda UAV <laughs> and everything else made it much easier to go back down into the weeds because now not only as a senior leader do you have. Uh, experience. Not only do you want to help because you don't want to just sit there and and you, and you have. But this, now you're watching people. <laughs> you have this perception that yeah. you have a better understanding of the environment, even than the guy on the ground, because yeah. you're watching this this bird's eye view of things, which of course is divorced from sound inputs of the battlefield, like yeah. 
gunfire and all those other things or or just the fact that these guys are down on the ground and they they actually yeah. know what's going on to some extent yeah um you know so it, it's it's a challenge there's it's, nothing worse than being uh one of the leaders on the ground and imagine, getting yeah. that call and being like mm, i wish that one thing wasn't here right now you know i i, I was on a, a on an sr team on a recon team at, at one point as a sniper and uh you know we'd go out and we were setting up all these different things taking pictures and whatever and we were testing some of this full motion video stuff and i'm like boys whenever we become just the people who in place this yep. sr is over like we are going to just basically be putting these listening and, and viewpoints out and we might as well be uavs at that point like we are we are going to lose our some yep. of the sauce of actually right. getting the atmospherics of a target that even if you have video and audio and whatever yeah. else, you just there's a different feel when you're there and you're actually seeing what's going on. You know, I I, I want to make sure that we have time because I'm really uh, I'm honored and blessed. Uh, you know, not just to have been able to be a Green Beret over the course of my career, but to now partner with the Green Beret Foundation for this podcast. Yep. Uh, you know, I mentioned in the first episode of this one, you know, sort of my reasoning behind, and it was personal to me, the Green Beret Foundation has helped me before personally. And I know uh, you're very involved now as the as the chairman of the board. And so I want to make sure we have some time to talk right. about yeah, the Green Beret Foundation. You know, obviously, as a three-star Green Beret, it's like, okay, yeah, it's our foundation, whatever. But what personally for you, what drew you to, yeah, that's that's the one, you know, there's so many great nonprofits. Yeah. What well, pulled what pulled you to the Green Beret Foundation? Um, two guys that had uh, had worked for me along the way, uh, Phil Mala and Jason McCarthy, mm -hmm. reached out and said, hey, we need you. Yeah, that's and great. Bottom line, you know, yeah. I, I at that point was not, was not yeah. looking for uh, – you know, something to fill my free time. Um, uh, but they, you know, Phil had been a team leader for me. Um, and then later on a, a company commander, you know, Jason was in the group as a young NCO. Um, but bottom line, when, you know, they called and said, Hey, we're, we, we need your leadership. We need you to stand up and do this. And they convinced me, of course, they may have undersold the level of commitment. Part. <laughs> We'd <laughs> never do that as Green Berets. Hey, come on in, buddy. <laughs> it won't be that. <laughs> no, and and uh, and honestly, I mean, I couldn't say no once they said, "Sure, yeah, we need your help." So, so here I am, four years later. This episode is brought to you by the Green Beret Foundation's Next Ridge Line Program. The Green Beret Foundation's Next Ridge Line Transition Support Program ensures that Special Forces soldiers and their families are prepared for all of life's transitions. Transitioning from active duty service to civilian life is one that all soldiers will go through, and this program provides a trusted resource for navigating the VA disability claims process. The GBF is the only soft nonprofit accredited by the US VA to prepare, file, and appeal VA disability claims and benefits. For more information, visit GreenBeretFoundation.org slash transition support. So unfortunately, within the Special Forces community, suicide has become an epidemic. And suicide prevention is something that we all want to take part in. And it's not just clicking through some slides uh, on a suicide prevention brief. The Green Beret Foundation stood up Andy's Fund directly to try to address some of the underlying concerns like chronic pain, TBI, PTSD, that previously weren't supported in suicide prevention programs. To learn more, please visit greenberryfoundation.org slash Andy's Fund. Yeah, well, you. Yeah, I was going to ask you. You've had uh, a, a chance to be a part of the organization for quite some time. What have you been proudest about uh, that you've seen during that time from from GBF? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, first of all, we've uh, we've matured as an org organization. We're not we're not done growing because sure. um, uh, you know I, I think the the board leadership, uh, our new CEO uh, Charlie Icono. I think we're all of one mind that. Um, much much like we'd expect down at an SF organization is you know you're you're always seeking to get better and, Absolutely. and that's what we're yeah. striving to do right now and um, but we're we're in a pretty good place I will say that the good news for the organization is the community recognizes the value we provide right we exist mm -hmm. to help the community and by that I you know we uh, about a year and a half ago made the decision that while GBF started out very focused on the post 9-11 generation, mm -hmm. you know, at the height of the war, the casualties, et cetera, sure. um, we made the decision that we we're gonna take care of every Green Beret. Yeah. That, um, that nobody's service was, was, uh, was more valued than anybody else. Um, that's somewhat of a leap. You know, we've now 
got to resource that and we're we're yeah. working towards that as our our goal but um you know that, that we're helping vietnam vets in our, our vso program our, our va benefits program we're helping mm-hmm. guys that served 30 40 years ago uh, because they need help yeah and um and so I, I guess the thing i'm most proud of with the organization is how they have stepped up to to meet the community's need and the need is pretty strong out there um you know whether it's folks that are transitioning out and are going through the VA process and are struggling to articulate Mm -hmm. to a a very cookie cutter uh, bureaucratic process, all those things I did carrying a rucksack and jumping out of airplanes and walking the mountains of Afghanistan or, you know, helping, uh, helping, you know, that portion of the community that is struggling with PTSD or substance abuse problems, um, or, or frankly, is just looking how to transition out of this great, yeah career they've served in with with a very clear purpose and and how am i going to take this step into the civilian world and so that's really something that we're going after now is my my uh you know desire for the organization has been that we will never lose focus over those who have given so much you Mm. know our gold star families are our top priority uh we're still taking care of those with the physical and emotional wounds of war but that's a, that's a small subset mm-hmm. of the Green Beret community, and I want the organization to be able to provide something for every Green Beret, mm-hmm. and that and that's why the transition program is so important. Uh, and then, frankly, part of it's um, I'll, I'll call it uh, selfish motives. But um, my my belief, a strongly held belief, is that the the folks that wear the Green Beret that have made it through our process are by and large a, a national treasure. They are, as, as we talked before, they're complex problem solvers. They're smart. They're committed. They're the kind of person who, when given a mission, figures out how to get it done. And that our nation needs their service even when they leave the service. And so a big part of what we're trying to do in Green Beret Foundation is, is figure out how do, we, how do we help them land well? How do we make sure that whether it's into business, into government, or, or whatever passion drives them, that we help them land well because it's to the nation's benefit and society's benefit. We can't afford to let them go off into some dark corner and not continue to serve the nation in some way. A hundred percent. And well said. I think uh, you know there's so much value that they can bring if uh, if Green Berets are able to transition into something that they're passionate about and that they can give back, it is a absolute um, imperative for the nation to be able to continue to use that talent yeah. for their next ridge line. And I, I, I agree with you um, that I'm, I'm super excited about the fact that it's been broadened outside of GWAT veterans. Like you and I both talked about earlier, like we were inspired, uh, although at different times, right. by Vietnam veterans and by others. And so you know, it would, uh, it would feel, um, it would, it would feel weird for me to be involved in it. Not also like as if, you know, a a Vietnam veteran green beret is not as, uh, you know, important as mine like the opposite probably. Right. right? Right. And so, uh, you know, especially with what they came back to versus what we were blessed to come back to a very, or or even those green berets that maybe served through the cold war, never shot shot in fire, but, but you know, we're a deterrent they built, they big built, time. Yeah. It, but they also built a legacy. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we think our our organizations, you know, bloomed overnight when the <laughs> when the to, uh, the towers came down. You yeah. know, we we were the inheritors of missions to Bosnia and Haiti and all these other things that that our our groups and predecessors did that helped build the capability and the knowledge set that set us up for success when when really needed in two thousand one. So a hundred percent. I I think yeah. uh, you know. We, t- we always talk about complex problem solving, waiting in the chaos and the ability of Green Berets to kind of just figure it out. Uh, but I'll tell you the other thing our nation is starved for in society is leadership. Mm. And, uh, and and Green Berets, at, no matter what position they held, uh, understand leadership both both as followers but also as, as leaders, whether they're you know leading themselves and one other on a team uh, you know, my I'm the I'm the senior weapons guy, and I'm leading that junior guy, or or they're, you know, leading 500 indige yeah. on a mission somewhere. 100. percent No, that's great. I uh, you know, I, I 
appreciate you taking the time. I've always enjoyed, uh, you know, kind of watching your career after we had done the 07 thing, but we also got a chance to work when you were doing some consulting with Deloitte mm -hmm. right. and, uh, you know, uh, during sort of the formation of Softcast. So I was very, yep. very thankful to you and the others that were helping us chip in because we were uh, breaking new ground and had no idea basically what we were doing. So I'm very thankful for that. You know, as a final question, um, you know, you talked about getting off the plane there in Berlin, you get met by your team sergeant, you got yeah, the- Munich. Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry, Munich. Munich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. You, Just you land in me. Munich. No, no, you're, yeah. hey, I, I, we want yep. it to be correct, right? Yep. You got you got young wife, brand new baby, you're, you're going into now being an SF guy. Uh, if you as now retired Lieutenant General uh, Ken Tovo could go back and have 10 minutes with Captain Tovo at the time, What's your advice to him? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> it's funny because you know I, I yeah you have sons <laughs> I've, got, I've got sons and one of them served and yeah. uh, um, my my first piece of advice to any anybody in the military is um, is burn no bridges. Mm. Uh, particularly in our community, we tend to be we'll call it self confident. Some might call it cocky, sure, self assured, uh, but we're we're also somewhat unforgiving of each other. Very much so, yeah. and 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 really hard on other people. Um, and and one of the things I've learned is that uh, you know this idea of burn no bridges. You never know the relationship you turn your back on, where that will play somewhere down the road. Mm -hmm. Whether it's you know the conventional commander in the battle space that you occupy. Sure. Uh, and so I've you know I've tried to counsel anybody who asks you know what's your what's your advice? It's burn no bridges. We we're, this is. You know, unfortunately, you know, if you, uh, you know, we, I use the, the word sport lightly uh, here. You know, it's a, war is a team sport, mm -hmm. um, and it's the whole team, right? It's the Air Force, it's the SEALs, it's you know, everybody. Yeah. And so, while we, we can, we can bicker and feud amongst ourselves when it's back here over yeah, a beer be behind closed doors, behind sure. closed doors, and sometimes not behind <laughs> closed doors. But when it's, uh, when it really comes down to it, this is it's all of us against against the adversary. Um, it's hard enough when we all can work together. If if personal baggage is brought in there of things that happened twenty years before when you went to school or you yeah, know, et cetera. Um, yeah, burn no bridges. No, it's great advice. I mean, we know uh, throughout what we've talked about during this episode. I mean, relationships are yeah, key. It's always right? Right. It's whether, whether it's relationships with your industry partner or relationships with the you know your conventional counterparts or or even you know inside. Hundred percent. People people in your home station. You know the the citizenry around where your group is. All of these different things. The relationships uh, play a huge impact. Well, sir, I'll give again. you one. If yeah, I can give go you ahead. One, please. I'll give you one last one, and it's. it's um, you know, I, I talked about how we never, we had no clue that the Berlin Wall was going to come mm -hmm. down. You know, the night it did, we had you know, very little warning. Um, I, I would say it's the same on a lot of these other things. You know, we there was very little warning when Saddam invaded. Uh, you know, er, every every day of training has got to be with the idea that we may be using it tonight. Yeah, a hundred percent. You never know when it's uh, you know ten September and you're doing you know a flat range, and all of a sudden it's really important. Yeah, right? yeah you're going to be getting on a plane in two or three days. So absolutely. Well, sir, uh, an honor, a great yeah, opportunity pleasure. to be able to uh, to chat with you a little bit, and uh, you know, thanks for coming in, and and to all of you out there, thanks for listening to another episode of Prep for Impact. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. If you have, take a moment, whether you're on YouTube, you know, thumbs it up, subscribe, hit the little bell. If you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, wherever you're listening to the show, do us a favor, subscribe, rate it five stars. And if you got uh, you know as much out of this as I did, you know, think about somebody that you could send it to who would also value or benefit from this uh, conversation. I want to give a, another shout out to our uh, presenting sponsor, uh, spec tool or spec ops tools, excuse me. Check them out on Instagram and at spec specopstools.com. And you can always find the Green Beret Foundation both on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all different pl manner of places, as well as going to uh, their website and find out more about some of the ads that you heard during this episode. So, for all of us here, thanks for listening to another episode of Prep for Impact. Thanks for listening to another episode of Prep for Impact. Just as a reminder, everything you heard on this episode and every episode of Prep for Impact are just the opinions of the speakers, whether that's the host or the guest, and they're not the official position of either the Green Beret Foundation, their employers, the Department of Defense, or anyone else. 
And with that disclaimer in mind, I want to take a quick second to give you my opinion on the best way to prep for impact. Across my life, whether it's as a Green Beret or personally, I found no more secret weapon than to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, my Savior, and to walk his path rather than mine. And so if you're curious about that, or if you ever want to talk, my DMs are always open. Thanks for listening to Prep for Impact.